There's been some chatter lately, I've seen it mostly on social media such as Twitter, about refusing to use or reference theologians and writers of the past who were guilty of what we would today call racism. These include slaveholders such as uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and people who said terrible things against the Jewish people such as Martin Luther. The attitude is something like this. These people were so flawed in their Christianity that they shouldn't be relied upon for good thinking or theology, and referring to them can be thought of as an endorsement of their errors. So, the thinking goes, if you quote someone like Jonathan Edwards, or speak of his ideas with approval, then others might think that you approve of his slaveholding. I suppose this is something like what some people would call cancel culture, just applied to the past. Now today, it's common to look for certain sins or failings in others. Sometimes they're real, I suppose sometimes they're imagined. And when those wrongs are exposed, to rally others in excluding that person from any kind of voice or influence. As it might apply to the past, with theologians and Christian leaders such as Martin Luther, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, J. Gratian Machen, and others, I would say that it's just up to each individual Christian to decide for themselves. Though each of these made their own distinctive contributions, I don't think there's anything significant in an idea or train of thought in them that hasn't been expressed by someone else in some way or another. I would say that it's something that each person should simply decide for themselves, not letting someone else decide for them. So read some Martin Luther, learn about his life, and decide for yourself if you want to read more. Read some Jonathan Edwards, learn about his life, and decide for yourself if you want to read more. Don't let someone else make a can't read or can't learn from list for you. Stay close to your Bible and figure it out for yourself, trusting the Holy Spirit to guide you. But here's the point I really want to get at. For those who feel that significant theologians and Christian leaders from the past should be canceled because of their racism, slaveholding, or anti-Semitism, if those people are interested in being morally consistent, I think it's important for them to apply the same principle to the here and now. Sometimes we find it really easy to condemn the sins of the past while ignoring the sins of the present day. Now, here's a very down-to-earth example. The modern policy of abortion on demand in the United States. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the U.S. has some of the most radical abortion laws in the world. In much of the United States, a pregnant woman can get a legal abortion at any time during her pregnancy, and for any reason whatsoever. If a woman is eight months pregnant and decides that she wants a girl instead of a boy, in many parts of the U.S. it's completely legal for her to abort the boy child that she doesn't want. You see, she can do it for any reason or for no reason, and at any time in her pregnancy. So here's my point. If you're going to cancel dead theologians and Christian leaders for their past sins, then you should also cancel every modern theologian or Christian leader who supports abortion or the political parties that support those policies and keep them in place. Do you see what I'm getting at? It's easy for someone to say, this dead theologian was a slaveholder. That's a moral outrage and no one should read him or refer to him. Now that's being moral about the past and there's certainly a place for that. But it takes more courage to be moral about the present. I think that anyone who would say, don't read or refer to Jonathan Edwards because he was a slaveholder, should also say, I will find out if any of the modern theologians I read or refer to approve of abortion laws in most of the U.S. or the politicians who support those laws. Again, that is if they are concerned about being consistent. I think that the parallel between American slavery of the past 
and American abortion laws of the present is very instructive. It's easy to read the ways that some Christians of the past justified slavery as it was practiced in America before the Civil War, to read those things and say, that's terrible. How could they as Christians ever think that this is a moral practice? How dare they use the Bible to justify this morally bankrupt policy? Now, it's right that it was morally and biblically outrageous for some Christians to support slavery in the U.S. before the Civil War. But is it really any different from how some Christians support unrestricted abortion in the United States today? Now, I suppose some people would say it's completely different. Abortion in the U.S. today is a very complicated moral issue. But that's exactly what many people thought about slavery in the United States 170 years ago. You see, some Christians today think that unrestricted abortion is a complicated moral issue. Some Christians back then thought that slavery was a complicated moral issue. Some Christians today think that restricting or outlawing abortion in the U.S. will lead to many worse problems. Some Christians back then thought that the abolition of slavery would lead to many worse problems. Some Christians today think that good Christians can disagree about unrestricted abortion in the United States. Some Christians back then thought that good Christians could disagree about slavery. There are Christian denominations today that officially support the present abortion policies in most of the United States. And there were Christian denominations that supported slavery back then. Some Christians today are fine with belonging to and supporting politicians and parties that are totally committed to absolutely unrestricted abortion in the United States. And some Christians back then were fine with supporting politicians and parties that supported slavery. And finally, some Christians today try to make passionate arguments from the Bible and morality in support of unrestricted abortion. Well, some Christians back then tried to make passionate arguments from the Bible and morality in support of slavery. You see, it's easy for us to make something of a cartoon of the past and wonder why people in the past could be so wrong about things that seems so clear to us today. It's not as easy for us to discern the moral issues of our own day, especially when the culture is divided over those issues. But honestly, in a hundred years, how will people look back on the abortion policies of the United States in our own day? You know that it's quite possible that they will look back on it with the same sense of moral clarity that many people today look back on slavery in America before the Civil War. Just as we look back and say, how could they allow that back then? How could any Christian approve of that and support it in any way? In a hundred years, they will ask the same questions of our generation regarding the fanatical zeal to preserve unrestricted abortion in the United States. Now, as for myself, I don't think that I will be canceling Luther or Edwards or Whitfield, so I don't need to go through my books and sources and cancel anyone today who approves of unrestricted abortion or the politicians and parties that support it. But I think that I can only take seriously those who claim to see clearly when it comes to the morality of slaveholding, if they also see clearly regarding the morality of abortion, especially unrestricted abortion. Now, if you're going to cancel people of the past for taking a, or for failing a moral and biblical test when it comes to slavery, then please be consistent and cancel the people of our day who uh, have the who fail the moral and biblical test when it comes to abortion. Finally, I hope this can give you 
a little perspective on how we can perhaps understand the complexity of modern issues, but at the same time have little appreciation for how the issues of the past seemed to the people of their day. So what's the answer? Well, I believe it's this. Keep your theology rooted deeply in the Bible. The first question to ask in evaluating a particular theologian or commentator should be, do they rightly divide the word of truth? Do they honor the God of the word and the word of God? Now, after that, if you want to take their personal life into account, their triumphs or their tragedies, then you have liberty in Jesus Christ to do so. But let's be morally consistent and not close our eyes to the truly great moral issues of our present day. Something to think about. I hope you will.